How y'all doing today? Has this been a good weekend? Is, is the energy still up? I was kind of wondering, you know, it's like after four o'clock on a Sunday, you've been going through the whole thing. I'm like, yeah, people will probably be up to, up to listen to another talk, but kind of on the, on the downswing, the energy a little bit, if it's me anyway. I'm sure everybody kind of has their own like approach to how you manage your energy at a conference. A lot of the time I kind of start late on the second day. I'm like, I want to have energy to the end, so I'm not going to like try and do everything in the morning. But everybody's got their own approach. How is my, how's my volume? Is it, can anybody, anybody want it up a little bit? Okay, little up. Continue to check the mic. Is the volume a little better? Can we go a little louder yet? Testing. I'm going to try and not talk too loud because I don't want to strain myself. So I'm just going to like keep it at a reasonable volume and we can keep going up if anybody has trouble hearing me. That's awesome. Great. Thank you. Um, so let's get started. Test, test. Um, great. Um, I'm, we're going to leave five minutes of questions at the end. Um, but I, before we get going, I'd like to uh, um, give a big round of applause to Ryan. Um, and uh, please take it away. So this talk is uh, security by and for free software. If you're here to hear about security, you found the right place. Um, and this is something that's really important to me um, is to kind of frame my approach to this because security is a huge topic and there's infinite things to talk about and I have a very like narrow set that I want to bring to this audience today. And what, what kind of inspires this, my approach, is that I see security as a freedom issue. If you don't have freedom, then we kind of like uh, widely recognize that uh, freedom is a prerequisite for security. You have to be free to secure your own system. But uh, a, a system that is easy to attack also means that it's easy for other people to steal your freedom out from under you um, and get you to accept compromises that you don't like. So that kind of animates this. Um, my name is Ryan Pryor. I am a security engineer at CyberArk. Uh, we are a security consulting group that um, we help organizations build defensible systems. And um, I want to give big thanks to them for supporting my participation in this community and in particular my development of this talk. Um, there's some things that uh, are widely associated with security that I'm not going to cover at all. Uh, among them, I'm not going to talk about detection of like, you know, our antivirus, anti-malware, uh, in detecting intruders in our systems. This is not a how to secure your application using TLS. Of course, like, go, you know, go uh, search HTTPS everywhere and all these great tools we have. That's not my particular thing. And this is definitely not an everything that's wrong with security today talk. Um, and I go to a lot of those, right? I, as a security person, I go to a lot of talks. It's like, we need to do better on this thing. Those are important talks, and this is not one. I'm going to talk about uh, defense in depth. And I'm going to define that and talk about what it means to me and what it can mean to the free software community. Um, I'm going to tie that to our current environment and some of the status quo and the things that we see regularly. And I'm going to emphasize the role of systems thinking in moving beyond some of the things that are maybe dragging us down or holding us back and in envisioning the secure future that we can and want to build. Whew, I'm going to drink a little water. I've got to pace myself, right? A few principles of, of uh, of defense in depth that I'm going to talk about are up here. In general, the concept of defense in depth is that we want to have layers of security. And we want to have a, a, a multi-tiered system with, so that we can operate on the assumption that not every part of the system um, needs to be secure for us to have a certain amount of security overall. Instead of the security being a chain where each link in the chain has to be equally strong, we kind of want to have some, some safety nets. We kind of want to have some uh, of, and this is, kind of gets into the concept of a defensible system that I'm going to talk more about. The, pr the principle of least authority talks about agents being over-authorized. 
And an agent is like, I could be an agent. I'm a, I'm a person in an organization. You've got a bunch of people that are agents. Each mas machine is an agent of its own. It can initiate uh, requests or you know, have its own actions in the system. And, um, and a process, uh, you know, we can think of the, uh, agents on like a process or application level too. And within this multi-tiered system of different types of agents, the principle of least authority is, uh, is obeyed when everybody just has what they need to actually do their job. So if I'm in an organization, uh, I have a certain role, and so I only have access to the things that I need for that. And anything I install, you know, I install it for a purpose, and it should just have access to that. Um, that leads us to the concept of granularity. If we're going to obey the principle of least authority, we have to talk, be able to talk about, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of data. And you've probably, you'll see violations of, of granularity everywhere where it's like, do you want to give this application sudo so that it can install in your system? Oh yeah, let's just, you know, you can touch everything now on, on the entire system as root, that's great. Or um, do you want to give this app access to your files and photos? It's like, okay, yeah, I guess. Go, go wild with files and photos. You know, it's like, if we are really practicing good defense in depth, we should be able to talk with specificity. Um, but there has to be an aspect of healthy boundaries. If you are, um, if you're constantly asking people, uh, do you want to authorize this action? Do you want to run this ad as administrator? Do you, you know, if it's this constant pop-up that if you want the functionality that you ask for, you have to hit OK, then, uh, when an agent is inevitably compromised, your boundaries will not contain the impact because you're trained to hit OK. So if we want to have healthy boundaries, it has to be in part of a system where uh, the, the person that's making the decision about whether this is OK or not is not being harried, is, is in a good position to enforce healthy boundaries. And as with other things in our life, we know that there are certain practices that will lead to healthy or unhealthy situations. And so we want to, we want to build that into our software know-how. Um, and the status quo of where that leaves us um, is, you know, we don't tend to have a lot of this stuff from defense in depth that I would want to have, except in maybe some, some limited domains that I will talk about of areas where we're doing pretty well. So our strategy in general is like we're going to keep bad actors out, right? We're going to scan our files. We're going to not download uh, attachments and run them as root. We're going to not click suspicious links, right? We're going to keep these bad things out. And if that happens, throw the device in the trash, reinstall the operating system, uh, you know, pray that the person uh, didn't, you know, that put malware on your system didn't really like have the preparation or the bad intentions to do something too evil, but maybe they did, but you don't really know, so maybe just throw the thing out anyway. Uh, it's like, yikes, I installed some malware, what now? Um, and so I like to, this reminds me of an anecdote that I learned when I was getting into the aerospace industry, and I worked for a little while for, um, for Delta, was learning all these things about the history of, um, of airplanes. So I'm talking about literal airplane hijackers in this slide, in the bad old days. And for a long time, the way that we dealt with hijackers was like, we're going to you know, scan everybody with a metal detector, we're going to have bomb sniffing dogs, we're going to do all this stuff and keep bad people and bad objects we don't like off of our planes. And if somebody gets through, which is rare, we let them fly the plane if they want. That's, you know, it's like we've done the research, there's a decision tree here, you know, this is like, it's not being done lightly. Uh, what people want is to ransom the plane, they want a certain amount of money, we have negotiators that are good at talking to these people, so the pilots should step aside, offer assistance if needed, you, their responsibility is to secure the plane and the passengers to, to the best they can while the hijackers are doing their thing. And we don't do that anymore. There was a change. And the impetus for that and many changes in the aerospace industry was 9-11. And it caused this entire rethinking of lots of ways that we look at the aerospace industry and security. And we said, okay, some people don't want to ransom the plane. Some people want to weaponize the plane. You know? and, um, and so obviously a lot of things changed the way we do security. But one of the biggest fundamental shifts that was really a mental shift, it was in a shift of approach is this concept that we're just not going to let anybody fly the plane, okay? Like, we're still going to do all these things. We're not going to abandon at all. We're going to str always strengthen this concept of keeping bad things out, but we're going to be prepared 
for certain bad actors to inevitably get access and we're gonna be prepared to resist them. So that's kind of what I mean by like this defense in depth is we can, we can apply this principle in a lot of places and say we need to have layers of security and be prepared to deal with bad things that happen. Unfortunately, it, with a lot of the discourse that we have around security and the more you learn about security, um, even people that are in the industry that are very knowledgeable tend to kind of accumulate this sense of despair. There's a number of, of places that are kind of like loci of how this happens or how we spread this. And one is that it's a common practice for us to badger people about adopting practices. And maybe when you came here, you thought that that's what this would be, right? It's like, I'm gonna tell you the things that like, if you're a free software developer, you need to do this. And it's like, it's not, that's not true. I have a bunch of things I could tell you about that I could badger you about that's like maybe something you're not doing that really would make you and your users more secure. But when we, cre when we, when we let that be the atmosphere and say this is what we're doing is we're badgering people, we create anxiety about security and that becomes a feature of our community. And um, so people have had that experience over and over of being badgered, and there's, there's this growing despair of like, what's the next thing you're gonna badger me about, right? Like some hacker is gonna discover some new thing, and it's just gonna be another thing that I have to do, and uh, so we ratchet it up, right? We, we warn of dire consequences and say, don't you know that there's bigger leaks all the time and these huge breaches and don't you care about the security of your users and recognize that this impacts us all and um, people that are responsible for this, that have taken this on in their soul, feel like compared to this punishment of Sisyphus where he was made for his crimes to roll a boulder up a giant hill every day only to watch it roll back down again and to go and chase another CEVE and another zero day, right? And, and we just say security experts will forever shout into the void and others will forever ignore their, device, their advice and we're just not gonna make our way out of this. And this is security despair, right? And I'm not here to tell you that this is wrong, unfortunately, but it is a thing and it is a thing that we deserve to name and we deserve to sometimes think about security outside of that sort of narrow lens of despair and to talk about what would be the sustainable, defensible security future that we want to build as a free software community for ourselves and our, for our users, and that is what this talk is about. So I'm gonna take another little break for water. Hopefully some of you are, are doing these things or have heard about them. If not, it's my pleasure to introduce you to some inspiring ideas that we have from the community. Um, I have a computer game for or I have a, a computer for games, and I have no games on my work machine. That's a common thing. That's like a really good idea. Uh, we have some separation there. I don't necessarily trust everybody that makes a game I think is fun with the sensitive data that I operate on in my work, right? So that's cool. Um, I've learned from web server admins that they'll often create a www user, and the web data all belongs to that, and it is its own little domain, and anything else that's going on in that machine is separate, it doesn't have access to any of that, and vice versa. So that's like, that's, that's an inspirational to me. Um, web browsers isolate each tab that you visit, so um, the tabs don't know about one another, they don't automatically like talk back and forth. If you go to one bad link, you know, hopefully the, the damage should be limited. That's great. And on a Unix-like system, your root user owns certain system files that are considered like important to boot, important to load other files, and things like that. And so if somebody, if you run a script that uh, maybe you shouldn't have, it can't change everything on your system. Unfortunately, it can probably change a lot and do a lot of damage to you. But it's like there's some, there's some boundaries. But, but these things aren't really enough, are they? It's like, they're inspirational, I love these things, but don't we kind of want that like for everything? We want to create this sense of like, I can afford to, to have a little bit of insecurity sometimes, like the same way that web browsers isolate tabs, don't we kind of like want to isolate anything that we don't completely trust? And we can get there if we use this technique of systems thinking. And I want to talk about a few things that we want to move beyond. And I'm, I'm using this arrow as kind of like a let's move beyond and not abandon the thing on the left side of the arrow, but let's embrace the thing on the right side of the arrow and recognize that it is key to a greater, more sustainable security. Let's move beyond individual practices and badgering people about you need to adopt this. And let's say that we have certain 
collective principles that when we give somebody a computing environment, whether it's an operating system, whether it's a, a device, um, that this principle will apply to that system and has been thoughtfully applied so that it's easy to follow those practices, so that it's natural and sort of default. Let's move beyond thinking about application features, like does this app support encryption? Does this app respect my privacy? And let's move those things towards the concept of platform guarantees and say, I know everything on my system supports encryption. The platform does that. Um, you can't just not encrypt things on this platform. You can't just uh, leak data without my knowledge that violates my privacy on this platform. And, and we can move beyond the concept of securing programs, like did we secure this, did we audit this in particular, to talking about a defensible system where we need to have lots of secure components of it that are audited, that are trustable, but if there are some parts that aren't quite so good, the impact is limited in what they can do to, uh, to hurt us. So let me take another break. I just need a sec to breathe. Because I want to talk about a bunch of things that this hypothetical platform that I want us to have can do for us that's going to be like really beneficial and also make us a lot more secure. And one of those things which I love from the web is the discovery and installation experience. For you to discover a new website, when you talk about time to value, how many seconds, minutes, hours does it take me to learn a new thing before I can get some value from it? Some websites with the you know, great work that their designers and engineers do are getting this down to seconds. It's like, you know, if I have a, uh, a website that lets me um, create art and I can start painting within seconds, it's like there was no installation process. There was no, like, I have to do this and run make and make install and, like, you know, uh, check the installation script to make sure that it's not downloading Trojans. And it's like all these things, right? And we trust the web browser to a certain extent. That part has to be, has to be um, secured. But it gives us this, this uh, experience of discovery. And in order to get that for all the things on our system, in order to build that into a, a free software platform that we can all use, we have to move beyond handcrafted sandboxing and to, uh, coming up with a, a, um, like a distinct plan for every application and talk about, as a platform, how can we automatically isolate each component? How can we build a plan that works for a generic type? Like, what does the plan look like for a calendar? What access does it need? What data does it need? So that we can isolate isolate it appropriately so that we get these things not just in our web browser but everywhere. Um, the platform can make our privacy be a lot better. We can automate the storage and handling of sensitive info for one thing. Um, right now, apps in general um, might uh, handle things appropriately. They might just write them to plain text. They might just log them to syslog you know, and dump everything. And so we can take the ability away from apps to do that. Like, apps don't have to be given right access to the file system. We can have certain, uh, certain syscalls or APIs or whatever it is that's appropriate to the platform that they can use to persist data, and that can automatically enforce the privacy and uh, encryption uh, policies that we want for our sensitive info. And we can move beyond this concept of handcrafted data handling of like, I hope this app's developers really care about my privacy, to say this is a platform guarantee, that we have this managed li data life cycle where we know where data comes from, how it's stored, how long it lasts, and how it's disposed of. Our platforms can free us at long last from remembering a bunch of passwords. And I know so many people that have a notebook of passwords, or they have a text file, or, you know, there's all kinds of things. People just use the same password for everything. Um, and people want to move on from managing secrets, um, installing root certs on their computer, going, you know, clicking through and this is okay. Yes, I accept this server certificate. All this, like, secret management stuff, um, we want to move beyond to a concept of uniform access control, where the platform has a certain standard for how we manage these secrets. And it doesn't mean that those things don't exist doesn't mean that on the back end there's no certs and there's no passwords anymore and we have like some magical unicorn thing. It's that the user need not manage these things and in fact should not. And if I am compromised as a user, 
if somebody's phishing me, if I have access to my passwords and my keys, then I can do what the phishing person wants and I can give them that stuff. If the platform is managing these things for me and is logging me in when I say to, then when the phishing website comes in, the login just won't work. You know, this thing is like, it's, I'm automatically protected. I have a safety net from the platform. So that's something that will make it easier for us to log into all our things and will terribly frustrate the phishing people and the scammers, which, um, so this is something that, that matters a lot to me. I'm a very social person. Uh, the way I work, I work with a lot of, um, of team members that were like always collaborating on things and making sure we're on the same page. And so live collaboration has become kind of like a almost table stakes for what you consider a really thoroughly modern application. Um, and when I'm in an application and I have interesting data that I found or something that I've created, um, I really want to be able to share that deeply, which is not to say I export my environment and then give it to you and give you like 13 easy steps to get back to where I was. I want to be able to share the view that I saw and have you just load that up with whatever data was needed. Um, and of course, in order for that to be seen, there needs to be a sense of access control. Like, for how long am I giving you access to this? Do I give you access to save this to your own environment? Um, you know, how is that going to work? What is reasonable? And so, the, you know, somebody that is involved in securing and developing the platform should think about that and should help us build this concept where we can move beyond managing files and say, can I share a file with you? Or is that in the cloud? Or is it here? Or whatever. And like, remembering all the different folders I had and where I put everything. And move to this concept, move beyond that to social computing, where I say I can share particular views of things that I care about. Um, I can collaborate with you live on any app in my system. And, uh, and that will thoroughly modernize the experience of how we operate with our computers and get rid of a lot of the frustrations that we have, while simultaneously making things tremendously more secure. So suppose that we have this hypothetical, um, this hypothetical platform. It's so great. It's like, how do we drive adoption to it? If our main message is it's more secure, we've like the security clan has got together and we have the secure thing, and um, that tends to not sell so well. I have an anecdote where like I tried to get people to adopt uh, Signal for a long time, and I've got a bunch of people to uh, to signal me. Um, and I just kind of like hit a wall where it's like I've more or less found which of my friends and, and colleagues and people will install that. And it's not enough better than WhatsApp or uh, Facebook Messenger or whatever they're using that they're, you know, it doesn't really appeal to their self-interest. And so when we're talking about um, what we want our platform to be like, something that we really need to focus on are those like intersections where we can say, we've made something more secure and we've made it better. And by making it better, we also get this more secure aspect. So like those last few things that I'm talking about, it wasn't just like we can make things more secure this way so everybody adopt that in your apps. It's like let's turn that into a platform promise so that people will want to move to that platform so that they know that their stuff is always private, so that they know that they'll always be able to collaborate with the people that they care about, so that uh, they don't have to uh, click through so many things and type so many passwords when they're on this platform and appeal to their self-interest. As an application developer, you don't want to do all that work. People don't want to implement passwords and access control and collaboration over and over again. If we can make that easy for application developers, it'll appeal to their self-interest and they'll adopt. Maintainers don't want to have to constantly um, deal with like, you know, what happens when that uh, collaboration server goes down? Or what happens when, you know, that version of that dependency that allows this particular encryption is deprecated because, like, somebody found an exploit of that, you know, version of that cipher or whatever. It's like, there's so much main maintenance load that comes from that. So if it's, if it's handled by the, uh, by the platform, then that'll take a bunch of maintenance load off of our people who are our wonderful maintainers, and it'll appeal to their self-interests, and they'll adopt, they'll buy in. And end users get all these wonderful benefits we've been talking about. There's certain words that you have not heard me say while I'm talking about all this stuff. 
And sometimes this is what people's mind jumps to when you say this is like, oh, you're talking about a framework. Like if we all use Django, you get that, right? Like that's a Django plugin, right? Like, yeah, automatic data encryption. But that's not what a platform is. It's not like everybody has to adopt the same framework and like manage their data models the same way. And like, um, you know, it, it, it should be something that's more generic that we can adopt with many different frameworks and, and many different paradigms. And it's not a programming language. Like, you can't say if everybody uses Java EE, like there's these great systems for Java that like you can do all this stuff that I said. But if you make that be the, the prerequisite, then um, you know it's not it's not going to appeal to everybody, and you're not going to get that buy-in. The platform needs to be something that's more low level than that. It's more flexible than that. And crucially, this is not a bandage or something that's not going to be easy. And I'm not here to tell you that this is the easy way out. Um, to borrow a, a metaphor from Matthew Green, uh, who's a security researcher, um, this is kind of like me being Gandalf here and telling you, okay, we're going to take a shortcut through the mines of Moria. Like, we're going to have to go in there and fight a Balrog. Like, this is not going to be this is not going to be easy, right? But the alternative is going over the mountains and dying. You know, that's the security despair, the mountains of security despair, or the mines of Moria, where we have to go fight the Balrog. But after that, we get this platform that gives us these things that we want, right? So it's like, I'm inspired to want to do this, even though it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be a bandage. I don't want to leave. Like, I could end the talk here and say, seize the day, let's go do this. Um, but I want to I wanna highlight some projects that are really moving us in this direction that you can adopt as hackers, maintainers today to secure your devices and to gain some inspiration of people that are doing things like in a way that really moves us towards this platform. None of these are like an implementation of what I'm talking about. Everybody needs to work together to move forward on this type of, of concept. But some things that you can do to secure your desktop today, you can install Bitwarden, which is a free software password manager, and everything I'll recommend is free software. Um, it'll store all your passwords for all your accounts, um, whether it's some app that you have, whether it's websites, and it'll automatically enter those things so that you don't have to worry about it anymore. That's great. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's phishing resistant, so that's cool too. Um, there's Flatpak and Snap, which are ways of packaging an application such that it's kind of automatically sandboxed, and you have certain uh, points where you can get things in and out of those application pods. That's cool. Subgraph OS is an entire uh, desktop OS built around that concept, where everything you launch, every document, every, uh, every Firefox, all these things are automatically sandboxed when you launch them. So if you open up two different Firefoxes, they're like completely separate processes that see different views of a file system that are network isolated from one another. So it's like um, everything in Subgraph OS has uh, a little bit higher level of isolation from one another while still being, while still focusing on a good consistent user experience like people expect. Cubes OS is a little different. It has a very similar concept, but it's like, what if we allowed the user experience to be very different and we wanted people to be very, allow people to be very specific and granular? Like, what if I want to have a VM that all it has is a PDF viewer and this one PDF that I think is sketchy that I want to look at? And so it's a VM that just does that and nothing else, and it has no internet access, nothing on any of your system. Then picture like moving that to everything. You've got one VM that all it does is handle your network traffic, one that all it does is talk to your USB devices. And Cubes OS is a whole swarm of VMs that do these different things uh, for you. And it's not the most efficient, but it's, it's very cool. Silverblue is another desktop OS that is immutable. So we were talking about like not every app needs right access to the file system. In Silverblue, nothing has right access to the file system. It's immutable. Uh, you can't change files. If you want to change what you have installed on your system, there's a platform uh, mechanism for that. And uh, unless you go through that mechanism, you can't change things. So sometimes we like that. Sometimes it's a little bit frustrating, but it's a really interesting um, view of how we could build distros. Moving to your phone. I don't have as many things because um, uh, the phone kind of does a lot for you. You already know, like, the, your phone asks you access to for a lot of things. Unfortunately, it's like, in some ways, it's not granular enough, and in some ways, it asks you too many times. Um, like, do you want to give this phone access to your whole device? And that sucks. 
But, um, but Bitwarden is available for your phone as well as your desktop. So free software, password manager, manage all your passwords on mobile too. Very cool. Um, an Orbot is a, uh, a daemon that runs on your phone that can route uh, certain apps traffic or all traffic through Tor, which can give you uh, some better security and privacy benefits. Um, and it's something that's available at the platform level. Apps don't need to support this. Uh, it, can, it, it can support everything. And in the cloud, this is kind of getting into like where I'm most professionally active. I, um, uh, CyberArk does a lot in terms of securing cloud things, especially for large organizations. Um, personally, I'm a NextCloud user, and so this is something that's very like consumer. You can deploy this today, and it uh, has a whole bunch of apps that you can use from like groupware, mail, uh, calendars, docs, files, these different things, and it has some way of securing all those things. Each one has kind of like a security story, and that's provided by the platform. And so if you want to write a new app for NextCloud, they've got guides and they've got standards for like how you do that so that it conforms to the platform standards. It is kind of a, a framework. It's all PHP. It, you have to use the framework. You have to implement it correctly. So it's kind of like moving in the direction of what I'm talking about in terms of a consumer platform. And they're interested in moving further in that direction. So that's something where I'm really excited to work with them on that. Um, Cloud Foundry is, uh, is kind of similar. It's not nearly as consumer. Cloud Foundry is, is more of the like um, enterprise IT version of this, and it's intended to be an operating system for the cloud. And so you deploy Cloud Foundry. It's free software. You can deploy it yourself, and then you can deploy apps. And something that's cool is that it's source-based. You deploy the source of the app to Cloud Foundry. It builds it according to a bunch of platform uh, specifications that you provide ahead of time of how we're going to handle data, how we're going to handle connections between services and all these things. And, uh, and so that's very cool. Uh, Conjure is an automated password manager for machines where you have like various keys, passwords, certificates that uh, are responsible for controlling access between a bunch of different services that you run. And so you don't want humans to necessarily have to like put those in their own personal uh, password managers and have access to them. We would like for those things to just be kind of like automated. And so uh, I work on Conjure professionally. I've contributed. I can answer all kinds of Conjure questions if it sounds like something that could be interesting to you. And it turns um, access into a platform feature instead of being something where you have to like uh, put secrets in your applications so they can connect to other things. Envoy um, is network isolation, where you say, I have some service that's running. I'm just going to not give it access to the internet at all. And instead, I'm going to define a certain list of endpoints that it's allowed to contact. Like maybe it needs to contact apt so that it can uh, use the repositories to, um, to update. And it needs to talk to one database. And that's all that it needs to do. So we create that list. And then you make connections to localhost. And Envoy picks those up and routes them to the right place without you even having to know where that is. And so that's a, uh, a free software network isolation system. It's cool. And Secretless is another uh, project from uh, CyberArk that some of my, um, my colleagues work on. And it removes the need for applications to have any secrets in them at all. So instead of delivering a secret to your application so that it can connect to like some web service, you're gonna, you know, it's gonna go fetch code from GitHub or something. So it needs a key to do that. Instead of putting the key in the application, the application can say, I wanna get this. Secretless takes that connection, picks it up, adds the appropriate key to it, and goes and gets a thing, and then returns the result to the application. So applications can remain totally, uh, totally innocent. They don't need to have anything at all. And all the keys are stored in this relatively tiny, uh, well-audited, secretless daemon that becomes part of the platform instead of having to put that in every application and make them manage their secrets appropriately. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. You know, I tr I, uh, these slides are available. So um, uh, there will be a link at the end if you want to go and look at all that stuff. Um, you know, this has been a uh, kind of a fire hose of information, and there's so many things that I cut out of this talk, you have no idea. Um, but let's just go over briefly the things that we covered. Um, security is a freedom issue. 
and we need to take security really seriously, and that doesn't mean badgering people constantly about security. It means working together as a community to build a defensible system that is really gonna defend us in depth. Um, systems thinking is the approach that we can use to, to imagine what is the system that will be defensible, what will it look like, how will it work, and how do we work together to get there. Um, we need to think about places where security is aligned with other interests, because that's where we're gonna get the best adoption. If you just build the secure thing and it works the same as everything else, uh, it's going to appeal to a niche that cares more about security than other things, and we're not gonna see the massive adoption that we need in order to secure all of our friends and neighbors. And you can get involved by adopting these things, um, by uh, helping push this forward, by writing about this stuff, thinking about this, and letting people know that you want these, uh, these features that we happen to know will also make us a lot more secure too. So um, thank you so much for coming, I really appreciate it. Um, if you have comments, uh, you can follow me on Mastodon or on BirdSight, um, and please uh, share your comments there. Um, if you want to grab these slides and do anything with them, they're uh, CC attribu uh, attribution uh, licensed, and uh, please give me your questions uh, if you have any from the talk. Have you given any thought to avoiding the word cloud, which was put into use to cloud people's thinking? Mm -hmm. So um, something that I think is really uh, important to talk about is whether, is to what extent you have access to something and to what extent you have control over it. And so uh, I, I use cloud advisedly mostly to mean places where you decide that it's worth giving up control. And that's something where, unfortunately, things are very skewed right now to where the convenience of having data available everywhere is, um, is so overwhelming that for a lot of people's use cases, they want to give up control to the cloud. Which I think is... that once we have a platform that moves towards a paradigm of social computing that can transfer files and, and do this access control automatically between systems without requiring somebody else's computer, then there will not be nearly so much of a, uh, a temptation to use this cloud thinking. I agree, thinking. but that's a different question. What you're doing is very good but can we get rid of the word cloud? Let's. <laughs> so we have to call that kind of thing something else. Cloudy, cloudy computing. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. And, and then that would suggest getting rid of the word cloud from all of our packages that we recommend. Let's not connect them with a cloudy and shady computing practice. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the time it's better to talk about federated things than cloud things. Yeah. You might be federating with somebody else's service. Yeah. You might be federating directly with the person, the neighbor that you care about. Yes. Uh, and there might not be some other service that's, uh, that's taking away your control of your own computing. And one other point. Do you talk about how free software is essential for security? Absolutely, Good. and I, that's something where, um, in my abstract, I, I took from the, um, I took a quote from the Free Software Foundation website, which kind of, I think, a lot of people take as foundational, that if you don't have the uh, control of, of your computer from a freedom perspective, if, if you don't have free software on your computer, you don't truly know whether you, what your security properties are. Um, and what I don't see acknowledged as much, although I don't think it's necessarily very controversial, but it's something that's worth talking about and that's worth framing this around, is that security is a freedom issue too, because we have to be able to maintain control of our, webs, uh, of our, uh, of our services and our, uh, and our machines, even in an adversarial environment, which we know we'll have. What I'm suggesting is it the other way as well, that is freedom is a security issue. Non-free software is automatically the enemy of your security. Anyway, it's time for someone else. Thank you, Richard. I think we can bring microphones up. Do we have a microphone to pass? There's some hands. If people can walk, it's better if they all go there and line up if they can. So uh, you mentioned a couple of tools, but you also mentioned that um, data lifecycle. 
management, right? Yeah. So, so that's actually pretty difficult to do, especially if you store data in different places. Well, if, you, if you can get closer to the mic or pull oh, the sorry. mic up. Okay. Um, so you, you mentioned a couple of times that um, life cycle management of data, but you didn't actually mention any app which does that. Um, what is your idea of how to implement an app which does lifecycle management and what are your lifecycle stages? So, um, so Conjure does lifecycle management in a limited fashion. So you don't store like your, your end user data or your, your important big blobs in Conjure, but you store your keys there and it can automatically rotate them. So you say we're going we're gonna, to uh, have a password that's for a service say and every day we're going to change the password and it can do that. And then uh, when we want to offboard that, we're not going to use that service anymore, then we can have it, you know, um, uh, handle that. And so in li I, I know of like limited tools that are specific to domains that I've worked in that do some lifecycle management. I'm not aware, and if anybody wants to send comments to my social media, I will broadcast them of uh, software that does this more generally and that gives us control uh, as consumers over our life cycle of our data as opposed to the things that I know more about which are like these um, these networking tools you know that are for like kind of more insider baseball security people okay and so my second question was what life cycle management states do you do you see are there right so um, so the first, so the life cycle begins when I've received some data from somebody or I've generated it myself. And often that's when I'm going to work with it the most. And it's kind of like, it, I, it falls off from there. So it starts out on my device. Maybe eventually I want to send it to a backup or to cold storage. I want to archive it. Maybe after a certain amount of time I want to delete it. Especially if it's data that I got from somebody else that I could get again. Right? And so a lot of the time, like there's things that are in my downloads folder that I go through and I clean out my downloads folder regularly, but why am I responsible for that life cycle management? If there's something that we know that I can download again from the internet archive and it's tagged as like, this is a durably archived thing, why should it sit there in my downloads folder when I haven't touched it for weeks, right? It's like I would love for the platform to have some, some consideration for that. And right now it's all left to the end user to understand each type of, of data life cycle and to do the appropriate thing, which we know people don't do. And they leave private keys in places they shouldn't. And there's all these things, right, where it's like, this is something that should have been cleaned up, but it's all left to us with our messy brains to do. So definitely a fire hose, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah. I try to drink from that, um, but I think for most of us it's pretty overwhelming. And I was just curious if we had to just sip a little bit from the fire hose where would you recommend we start? So the Electronic Frontier Foundation has a sort of privacy 101 that gives you an idea of like lots of tools and techniques that you can, uh, that you can adopt personally. And it is, it's not necessarily a systems thinking. It's like, what can you do as an agent? So I would suggest to start with your own things. If you're relatively new to this, if you come to this and and, uh, and you haven't done a lot to secure your own device yet, start with some of those things that are like directly applicable by you and make it real to yourself. Then start to think, what could I do? How could we change the way that we compute, the way that my phone works, the way that my computer works, so that people do this automatically instead of having to learn about it from some website and change their habits? question about secret lists. Uh, I love this idea. There are so many apps that I unfortunately have to use that require network access to, you know. Uh, so would this have to be compatible with the applications themselves? Um, or is, are these like passwords that are sent up um, stored in their own compartmentalized like user? So the way that it works in terms of implementation with the app is usually the app will have like a URL of where it's going to go. So like if I'm going to send a request to GitHub, my, I'm going to have a URL in the app that's like HTTPS GitHub.com slash whatever. So with Secretless what we do is we, we replace that first part with something that is in localhost. So we can create a virtual listener called GitHub. So you just do, uh, you know, HTTP GitHub and the same thing, 
but that's going to be picked up, that's registered as like a, lo as a local host networking by secretless. And so it's going to handle that connection instead of the real, uh, the real GitHub, and it's going to inject the secret that is needed to make that connection happen, and then return the data back. So the application doesn't need to know that secretless exists, you just have to be able to tell the app where to connect to. And we can talk about it more later, like, yeah. So if there are no more questions, um, another round of applause for Ryan. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Very inspiring.